Okay, welcome everyone to the Eastboard Research Colloquium. I'm really delighted to have three special guests today. Um, Laura Swettenham is joining us, Matthew Watson and Matthew Ashford. And they will talk about their organization, the International Federation of Esport Coaches, and will share insights into applied practice. So without further ado, I would hand over to Laura, Matthew and Matthew, who prepared a presentation to start with. And then we will move on to an open discussion where everyone is welcomed to ask his or her questions. So Laura, Matthew and Matthew, the stage is yours. Cool. Thanks, Ollie. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I've attended a few and uh, yeah, it changes things a little bit being in the, in the spotlight, but um, yeah, really happy to take part in this colloquium. So thanks for the invite. Uh, I have to check, can everyone see the screen that we're sharing? Yes. Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, as Ollie said, uh, we're here on behalf of IFEC, International Federation of Esports Coaches, to explain a little bit about what that organize, organization is um, how it works and given the sort of context that we're in today a little bit about the underpinning research there and we're also going to talk a little bit about applied practice in esports and a relatively new entity that we have um, that's focused on that sort of uh, work so to begin with this is exactly what i've just said so uh, we will finish with q and A. I I suppose that's the important part of this slide. So um, we do encourage uh, questions here. Please feel free to share them with Ollie and uh, Ollie interrupt us whenever you see fit. Um, yeah, the more critical, the better, in my view. Uh, I think this is sort of co-learning exercise. About us. So um, Callum isn't with us today, but uh, Callum Abbott, sport and exercise psychologist, uh, He's accredited with BPS, chartered with the HCPC in the UK, and he's our head of performance. So he um, he heads up our uh, activities in sort of that performance end of the spectrum where um, perhaps we're working with um, teams or coaches in applied settings. Uh, I'm Matthew Watson. Um, I guess the formal title is Director of Learning and Development at uh, IFEC. I suppose more informally performance coach or um, coach developer in a sense, and I'm currently in what is probably the seventh going on eighth year of my PhD at the German Sport University in Cologne and um, yeah the focus of my PhD is actually coaching in esports and some of you uh, know the details of the twists and turns that has been my PhD career and so um, over the last few years it's uh, it's been really a pleasure to be able to study more closely what is coaching in esports and uh, what is the role? What are the experiences of uh, individuals holding that role? And uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, one of the studies that have, have come from that. Laura, I don't suppose you want to go next? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm Laura. I am head of research at IFEC, but I'm, I'm also a qualified sport and exercise psychologist. So I kind of, I guess, straddle the two worlds of research and more academic work and the applied space too. Um, so work quite a lot with yeah, esports e teams, working with individuals um, and more like MDTs, um, but also spend quite a lot of time in traditional sport as well. Um, yeah, so yeah, just excited to be here today and to talk you guys through a little bit more about our, our applied work, what that looks like and yeah, how, how we work together as a team. Cool. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Um, my name's Matt. Um, so my title for, well, I'm a sport exercise psychologist, first and foremost. Um, I'm close to getting my chartership, hence why I've got my natal asterisk next to my name. Um, but I should have that soon. Um, my role with IFEC is professional practice lead. So similar to Callum in terms of uh, working on performance, but I look at the more holistic side of the player's experience. So that will be around well-being. Um, organizational cultural development so I see my role is very much around that um, and I very much support on the applied side I do a little bit on the research of IFEC but mainly my role is to help organize the performance support for teams and help lead on the psychological side of any work we do with players um, like Laura my experience has been mainly in traditional sport I was in football for nearly three years um, and last year I started work with Guild Esports and I've been their academy psychologist for the year 
and then I've been with IFEC for about eight months now so and it's been really exciting so uh, really looking forward to sharing all the stuff we're doing um, with you guys today Brilliant. so that's a little bit about us and now the backstory so I think uh, esports loves an origin story so let's go back to about 2019 um, where I think the this notion of the International Federation of Esports Coaches was first uh, formulated. Um, none of us were involved at the time. And in fact, we had uh, two co-founders come together from quite different backgrounds. Um, one of them was very much um, in gaming and esports, uh, was a, a reasonably successful League of Legends player himself, um, and wanted to set up a platform um, where coaches could come together and offer their services uh, out to yeah, aspiring players or existing players or teams. Um, and I think back then that was that was probably a fairly novel idea and um, not so much today. But with that idea, one co-founder met the other co-founder and discussed the, the lay of the land in esports. Um, the other co-founder not being from esports had a long career over 35 years in child protection and safeguarding. And the first question that came into his mind was, um, well, what's, what's, um, what's keeping people safe in esports, especially given that it's um, often a, an activity pursued by young people and uh, predominantly online. So what are the safeguards in place to make sure that uh, coaches are who they say they are, they're doing what they um, claim to be doing, and that everyone uh, is protected from yeah, any sort of uh, wrongdoing or harm. So that's his concept of safeguarding. Um, so from this idea of a coaching platform, combined with this idea of safeguarding, uh, sprung IFEC, this International Federation of Esports Coaches, which was um, aiming to be a platform or a place where coaches would come together, um, be background checked, and um, enter into a directory where they could show the world they are who they say they are, and they are checked, and they are taking their careers as professionally as could be in 2019. However, safeguarding is probably only one side of the coin. And I'd like to emphasize here that we're not a bank. This is a, a metaphor here. Um, so safeguarding is one side of the coin. It's not really enough if you're being a coach uh, just to set out to do no harm. Of course, there is an expectation that you will do some good too. And so in thinking about uh, a, a federation, um, a platform for coaches, where there is some background check in place, you also got to think, well, is there potential for this platform to help coaches in their practice and develop some competence in being a coach uh, to go along with what they already bring to the table? So there we're looking at this idea of training. So we have this coin, one side of the coin being safeguarding, the other being training. Um, shortly after uh, the uh, IFEC was, was formed, uh, the two co-founders found me um, through some work I was doing at the German Sport University in Cologne, and they asked the question, can we train esports coaches? Is it possible? Are we there yet? And I think start of 2020, that was still a very interesting question. And uh, it was actually uh, a question raised in uh, a seminal paper on esports, uh, first authored by one of the attendees here today, Ismail Badrasa Ramirez. Where we spoke, where he spoke about the needs for coach education and the challenges here. So that sort of began our journey, and it represents some real areas of key activity for us. That being safeguarding, that being education, and that being the research to underpin everything we're doing. So trying to generate knowledge to contribute to our understanding of coaching and to inform any training activities that, that we might do for the benefit of the industry and also personal cur cur uh, curiosity. So that's the sort of backstory. Um, I'd like to talk now a little bit, given where we are, esports research colloquium, I'd like to talk a little bit about the underpinning research that sort of supports uh, this enterprise. So firstly, rather selfishly, I have to announce I just had a paper accepted. So August 30th, after a long time, uh, my study uh, of um, esports coaches was accepted. and. Uh, I have to thank my co-authors for bearing with me and uh, struggling through this process with me and producing something that I think is of real value. The title uh, has changed a bit, um, but the final title is Introducing Esports Coaching to Sport Coaching, not as Sport Coaching. And this is important given where it was published. So it's been published in Sports Coaching Review. And 
for this paper to appeal to the world of sports coaching researchers, it had to be relevant to them. And just saying that research hasn't been done in esports coaching isn't a reason for people in sports coaching and sports coaching research to be interested. In fact, one of the reviewers' comments in our first round of reviews was, why should I care? So we positioned this as sports coaching knowledge is being used and applied in esports. Therefore, it is in the interest of all sports coaching researchers to pay attention and be informed about this area, this context of coaching practice. Hopefully the paper will be uh, published online soon. I'm hoping this week, it would have been nice to be today, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. But just to describe what we did in this paper and what we found, we conducted uh, semi-structured interviews with 14 uh, professional League of Legends coaches who were um, leading professional teams from tier three up to tier one. So tier one being LCS, LEC, uh, tier two being um, NLC and that kind of level. And we had one coach from UK, the then UK LC. Uh, we went through a process of inductive reflexive thematic analysis and the four, um, four of the authors were involved in that. And then uh, the two final authors were, were, were critical friends in that process. And we went back and forth and I think we generated or constructed some, some fairly robust themes from what was a lot of data. And the four themes that we pulled out were that there was no career path or standardized or codified education for coaches in esports. Uh, a lot of them were passionate about um, gaming and uh, esports in particular and being part of that world. Not all of them had significant playing careers themselves, but they had um, a good network of, of peers around them. Um, they had the opportunity to step into a team that may, maybe needed a coach figure. And uh, yeah, they access, access positions through uh, a great deal of um, intuition um, and yeah, some luck and um, some knowing the right people and being in the right place at the right time. But a lot of them professed that they wished there was a more codified or more structured path to, to develop or, or, or pursue. Some of them even mentioned psychology degrees, which is of interest to this presentation. Uh, secondly, the coach's practice was very much shaped by a pressure to win. So they felt like when they entered into a coaching position, there was a pressure on them, an obligation to win now and almost win at all costs so coaching practice was very much shaped by that. So it became rather directional, one directional in the, in the sort of pedagogy of it. And um, you could imagine there was some emotional toll from this. So uh, they really had to handle a great deal of strain and stress at times. There were at times notions of burnout towards the end of a split um, from these coaches. Thirdly, and this is perhaps where, where it's really of interest to sports coaching researchers in that it was very dynamic. You know, we know in League of Legends that there are regular uh, changes to the game in the form of patches. It's technological, so the game doesn't exist without some interaction with technology. And actually, uh, some of these coaches worked solely online, some in gaming houses, but the online ones certainly had to engage with messaging platforms online uh, on an almost hourly basis. And it's global. So the coaches didn't just have to take, pay attention to what's going on in their immediate environment. They had to pay attention to what's going on in a completely different region to try and inform their strategy um, within the game or within their team uh, in any given moment. And finally, challenges and paradoxes. So this was an interesting one uh, to construct because it was sort of saying how coaches really wanted to do the right thing, but often the conditions in, of esports at, at that time really limited what they could do. So, for example, being interested in the holistic health and well-being of players, but not having the perhaps the, the resources or the time to be able to do so. And we can delve a bit more into that um, uh, later on in the applied side of this presentation. But just to highlight that this is one of my favorite quotes from the, from the study which was that uh, our coach 13 said, we always want to say going into every discussion and everything that we are offering equality, but the star player is just a little bit more equal. And this was fairly important to me because it shows the coach really wanted to do the right thing, but given the, the limitations of, of the work, the context they were in, they really had to sort of push with what they felt was best uh, in that sort of short-term um, short term context, I suppose. So that's one of the foundations for, for the work we're doing at IFEC. So, we want to provide these career paths for coaches. We want to help them handle the interpersonal, interpersonal side of their work. Um, we want to help uh, sports coaching 
researchers and sports coaching developers bring their knowledge in and also learn from this sort of dynamic technological environment. And certainly we want to develop esports to the point where these challenges and paradoxes uh, don't put um, players' health and well-being secondary to the performance outcomes. Some more evidence just very briefly. I don't want to go on too much about this, but um, we know that coaches and and um, the current sort of way of thinking in esports is very much uh, you need to have a high level of game specific knowledge. But we also know from sports coaching that you probably need a balance of professional knowledge, the game specific stuff, the, the way of teaching that stuff. You need the interpersonal skills and the interpersonal knowledge to be able to work in a complex social environment full of you know, relationships at different levels. And you need to have the interpersonal knowledge to know yourself, to be self-aware, to be able to reflect on what you're doing and to know where to develop and where to pursue uh, coach development and coach education to sort of yeah, pursue a, a, a further sustainable career in coaching. So we tend to focus at IFEC on the interpersonal and the intrapersonal and the pedagogical, the pedagogical aspects of professional knowledge. So we wouldn't necessarily tell a coach, you know, what in-game concept is particularly important um, given their last five performances, but we might say, um, and try and get that coach to reflect on why they're going into a training session, focusing on what they're focusing on, perhaps where they see themselves in position to their players, where they see the decision-making power and authority, um, and how they can, um, yeah, improve themselves by by means of developing reflective practice and things like that. That might take them um, not just through their esports coaching career, but also through a, a career across their lifetime if they choose to exit esports. On the right, there is something that's um, on the horizon for us. Um, I'm very interested in this concept uh, of coach education and how coach education exists in various different. Um, methods perhaps, maybe there's different forms of coach education. So there is the formal, there is the attending a, a class or a, a workshop or a seminar, getting information from a form of teacher and um, understanding the reason why that education is, is important and then going away and trying to apply it. There's also perhaps more informal education that is just as valuable. So this is coaches discussions with other coaches and with peers where, who have had similar experiences exchanging ideas, working through challenges together. That can be mediated or unmediated. And I think we're in a place now where we're trying to set up a community. And um, next year, we're hoping to introduce a community of coaches, which will facilitate this community of practice, where there will be some mediated uh, discussion around important topics uh, to help coaches make sense of, of their practice and see if that has an impact on these interpersonal and interpersonal aspects or areas of, of expertise for coaching practice so that's hopefully coming soon ish well, well yeah don't don't keep me, don't hold me to that so that's kind of the evidence base that we're working from and certainly every step we take forward in in delivering resources to coaches we try and back it up with evidence and where there is no evidence we'll try and generate that knowledge ourselves or collaborate with some of the, the researchers on this call for example so some examples of what we've done in the area of safeguarding, we've published a, a white paper that explains perhaps some of the key policies and procedures that teams and coaches themselves might need to be aware of when working with players, especially players under the age of 18. We published a guidance document that went out last year to, I think, certainly over 100 uh, organizations and key players and, and profiles in esports. And we've been collecting and collating, uh, collating that feedback to put together a guidance document that has practical tips that will help inform the industry about their obligations in terms of safeguarding. In the area of education, I suppose what's on the horizon for us that's really um, sort of exciting for us is that we're gonna be releasing some uh, coaching certification programs in the form of uh, three levels. So these are gonna be heavily psychologically informed. They're focusing more on how to coach rather than what to coach. And we're hoping that they're gonna give coaches a meaningful esports certificate, and by no means is this gatekeeping. It's no, it's not a, a, an act of you have to have this certificate to be a coach in esports. This is more a support for those coaches that that what are interested in learning a bit more about the the process of coaching. And we feel we've put together some evidence based resources that are of interest. We've done some work in an applied setting, so working with coaches and, and aspiring coaches in the form of the with national student esports. So. That's working with coaches, uh, that's working with students at the university level in the UK. And 
introducing them to, to this notion of coaching in esports and how they might channel their interest in gaming and esports into a coaching role or a role on staff with a team, for example. Um, I, we were very grateful at the start of this year to be able to go and um, share some insights with uh, the Team Vitality coaching staff. Thanks again to a colleague, Ismail Pedrasa Ramirez. And we've written a few articles here and there, and including at the very bottom there, a four-part series for UK coaching, which is a, a mainly sport coaching uh, publication, to inform them and uh, people that read that publication about what is esports, what is coaching in that area, where do MDTs come into it, for example, and maybe other things like safeguarding and parenting in esports. And on the right there, we have some publications. Uh, uh, another recent acceptance was the, the final paper there, Perceptions of Effective, Effective Training Practices in League of Legends. That's interesting and in it probably verifies a lot of our suspicions about, um, about the experience of what it means to be a, a player in, in League of Legends at the moment and how there is this grind culture and this, this feeling that we have to just play as many games as possible. Uh, otherwise, our standards will slip or our ranks will slip and the chances of us getting signed up professional team are, uh, will slide away. So that's quite an interesting paper and hopefully the, that'll be available online soon enough. Just a few more slides for me and then I'll, then I'll shut up. We're trying to be as, uh, yeah, credible as possible here. We're trying to keep our, hold ourselves to a, a whole sta high standard. We're trying to be um, accountable to people that really know what they're talking about in terms of coach development, in terms of um, the potential for esports coaches to develop players and from coaches themselves. Hence, we're soon to announce a new website and a prominent feature of that website will be our board of experts, which we're gonna be announcing. One of which I, is on the call. And uh, it's yeah, really a great, great honor to be able to work with these three individuals. Dr. Ava Elmer, she's a high performance coach developer um, working I think with the Australian Cricket Board or Australia Cricket. I think she's also involved in the Australian Olympic uh, setup over there. Really a high level of expertise about what it takes to really develop coaches. Dr. Michael Trotter, his PhD focused on positive youth development in esports. He has some really inc incredible insights into um, the practice of coaching and what, what it could look like uh, in esports. And uh, James Torrick Thompson, uh, in my mind, one of the, the best esports coaches, best League of Legends coaches out there. So watch this space for him uh, to step into the LEC in uh, years to come, if not months. So that's our board. And um, I, I'm in, in, in them, they are fantastic individuals. So I think that's me. Oh, after all that, if there's any questions, feel free to interrupt. I was on a bit of a roll there. <laughs> But uh, if there aren't, I will pass over to Dr. Laura Swettenham. Thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, now we're going to switch a little bit from, I guess, I focus perhaps the, um, well, I say more research side, but I, I guess a little bit the, the, the research side, but more onto the, the applied side of our work. And we just wanted to start off by talking about um, our training. So myself, Matt Ashford and, and Callum, so the training that we've been through in the UK um so I suppose so, so this kind of starts off with um Matt if you can click I think here um so this starts off with um of course traditionally uh going on to a three-year BSc so this might be in sports psychology it might be in traditional psychology uh could be sport and exercise uh, sciences but it needs to be accredited by a kind of professional body um and then going on to a one-year MSc so I really kind of see this stage of, of our training as sports psychs as, um, I guess, getting to know the theory, starting to understand what might be behind some of these things that perhaps we, you know, see on the TV or see whilst we're watching um, people perform. So kind of becoming scientists, I suppose, in a sense, so on that more academic side. And then when we have completed that, we have the option to, to switch to the next kind of stage of our training, which is well a lot more applied, a lot more um, looking at the nuts and bolts that might be going into performance or um, how we observe this within individuals and teams. So we have three options in, in the UK to, to do this. We can either go on to uh, the British Psychological Society's stage two training, which is what Matt Ashford and Callum um have just completed or nearly completed and then we have BASIS so this is the British Association of Sport and Exercise Sciences 
um, and then the professional doctorate. So I personally went on the professional doctorate route. And the only difference here really is that it gives you a little bit more of the, the research behind it. But why am I bringing this up? So I, I just think it's important, um, I guess, to, to understand the pathway that we've been through and what this has kind of given us. So I think a massive part of this is that, so we're not actually allowed to do applied work. So work with say an esports player or an esports team, unless we are enrolled on one of these kind of second stages. Um, and this is because we don't have a supervisor. So as soon as you enroll on one of these professional routes, you get a supervisor and then they support you through your practice, help you when you fail. Um, yeah, be there for you to reflect and to learn and hopefully just speed up that development somewhat. And this process kind of across, it might be kind of three, four, four years, depending on whether you're part time or full time. But it really allows you to understand, you know, yourself. So there's a lot of kind of soul searching, I would say, in this process. So who am I as a person, a sports psychologist? And what does this mean when I am, you know, working with a client, when I'm speaking with an esports player? How am I turning up um, into this session? What does this mean for my professional philosophy and my values? How am I reflecting on what I'm doing and why I'm doing it? And of course, giving us some of those more I guess, I suppose like tangible skills, whether it's uh, counseling skills or whether it's learning certain approaches like CBT or ACT. So yeah, I just wanted to yeah put that out there just to show what, what we've been through and what's involved in that applied side of our training. So we go on to the next slide. I just popped this up. So a lot of you are probably familiar with this, um, but this is Keegan's model of kind of sport psychology practice. So I've jigged it around a little bit um, but the process that then we go through and that we hold to uh, in our work uh, with, with in, in esports is, is this really. So this might be with individual players, it might be with coaches, but also if it's really well when we're working with more of a multidisciplinary team. Um, so initially, obviously, we'll, we'll go in, do our intake and needs analysis. So we're really at this point trying not to do anything. We're really trying to understand the environment, understand the people within it, the values perhaps of the team, um, and starting to collect data in a sense so that we can um, then go into our case formulation. So this is when we're trying to take all the pieces, all the little bits of data that we found from our observations, from our conversations, and start to piece it together and, and link it back to the theory and think, okay, well, what, what does this mean? Um, and then of course, we'll go into picking an intervention kind of based on what perhaps our philosophy is, perhaps what our favorite approaches are, but of course, what, what fits for the client. Um, and for us, um, obviously, and we'll speak about this a little bit later, but when we are kind of planning the intervention, we might be thinking about who's best out of us to, to lead that. So whether it's myself, whether it's Callum or Matt, um, and also here, I think an interesting angle is whether it is us delivering it or whether it might be a coach, for example. So let's say a coach has a much stronger relationship with a player than I do, and perhaps I'm not embedded properly within in the team. It might be best to plan the intervention so that the coach is working with, with the player rather than um, me directly, for example. And then, of course, we go through our kind of delivery and monitoring. And, and this is really important for us so that we can ensure that we're not just, you know, going through the same process and getting the same same results. We are trying to make change and improve things. And, and that's why I've put this model into a bit of a circle, because we are always going back through, uh, let's say, um, we're monitoring and things aren't really changing. Well, perhaps we actually go back to the needs analysis. Perhaps we tweak our formulation a little bit and, and put something else into our plan. And this is all kind of supported by what's around the outside. So our ethical standards are massive and is something that we, um, yeah, I guess, learn on, on that training route. So what are our boundaries? How do we work with confidentiality? Um, when do we refer if there's a clinical issue? Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit of an overview about how we might work through, I suppose, a case, like I say, whether that's an individual or as a group. And what we're going to go on to now is I'm just going to pass over to, to, to Matt and he is going to, yeah, just say, why is this needed? Why is this important for us to be in this space? Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, so I think it's a really important question. 
Um, because it's the one that will get asked by the head of the orgs, maybe even the coaches who might even be slightly skeptical. Obviously, in the field of esports, no different traditional sport that there is a bit of skepticism towards academia and its relevance. So this is a question that we all need to ask ourselves is why are we needed here and how can we justify our role? Um, so it might come across that we're a little biased because as psychologists, we're going to want to work in that space and we're going to want to find issues. But um, I think if you look at the default culture in esports, um, the, there's reason to be concerned and then there's reason to be optimistic that we can do a lot of good work. So I think the first thing to point out is that esports is a very unique environment. And as sports psychologists, we're traditionally trained in traditional sport. So I think the first thing we need to recognize ourselves is actually what are the unique demands in esports that we might have to be careful of that we don't see in traditional. Uh, one of them is, is this really, is that players can become pro or they can get to incredibly high level without ever really going through a support system. And in a way that has a lot of benefits, so they become probably better independent learners than traditional sport athletes. And they, they, they learn to rely on different methods of support, which might be equally beneficial for in their personal lives. Um, but, but equally, what can end up happening is that they can end up making too hard of a transition uh, into the esports space or the professionalized esports space and really find themselves uh, struggling. So as you see on the left here, we've got so playing with friends online, enjoyment, learning from the game. I think there's a model out there which talks really well about this, that what happens is we play the games of fun initially, and then we transition and we start to see ourselves being good at the game. And we start taking ourselves a lot more seriously and evaluating ourselves. Um, and then we, when it almost the game becomes a completely different thing for us. So when they enter these esports environments, um, suddenly things change. So it goes from having a lot of autonomy to being a bit more restricted and told what to do. Um, it goes from focusing on maybe just win loss and kill death as something that's sort of how you dictate how good you are to actually skill development um, and obviously being self-directed and then being taught by others. So there's a lot of things that basically end up happening when they go into this environment we've got to really be on the lookout for. Um, so we see our role really going into this, uh, into the professional esports space is probably helping players to understand this a little more and to develop this kind of, kind of contextual awareness uh, around these things. Because often I don't think players probably recognize um, uh, just how much it impacts them and their performance. Um, and then on top of that, we want to try and help educate coaches and organizations to look out for these factors because some of them are more helpful to performance than others. So the grind culture is a very big one. And uh, whilst deliberate practice is important to getting better at a game, um, without that being counterbalanced against well-being and, and wider lifestyle, uh, we can quickly find that players will their well-being will be diminished and then their ability to perform long term is impeded. So um really if you look at the whole and if you look at the overall science and the research on stress and coping um there's a lot of things we can do to support players um, more holistically in the esports space i think apologies had to try and find the mute button there so on the back of all that and uh, knowing that we're um we're sort of invested in research we're invested in developing uh, coaches and coaching pathways we also recognize that we have these applied skills um, on the team and there is certainly a mandate out there uh, to to bring um, practitioners with appropriate training and background into esports to provide support and i think we all agree that support is necessary in in esports to to help people really realize um, the full potential that esports has to offer in terms of connection, community, um, self-development, professional development even. And so we felt that actually the best move um, for us to be able to do this was to uh, initiate, start, launch uh, a new enterprise um, called Acolyte, which is our applied work. All of our applied work will be under uh, the Acolyte banner. And um, I suppose the there are certainly a few uh, performance support entities out there. I think what we pride ourselves on is working from the evidence base and bringing together the multidisciplinary team based on a thorough needs analysis. Uh, 
and I think we're going to go into into that in the next uh, next few slides. But um, yeah, just to say that this is um, now up and running after a long time planning behind the scenes, and I think we even have a fancy new website. And websites, uh, as some of you might know, have never been our forte. So we're, we're pretty proud to have one out there that is actually uh, sort of on par with some others in esports. So I'll just hand over to uh, Matt and Laura now to explain a little bit about how this, uh, how, our, how our support process works um, through Acolyte. Thanks, Matt. Um, so I'll quickly go through, through this. Um, another model for you. You're going to have models coming out of your ears. I apologize. <laughs> um, but this is just one that I suppose a little bit more refined for our work with um, Acoly uh, within Acolyte and how we yeah, work together as a team there. So our aim overall when working, whether it's individuals, whether it is with a full team, is to, yes, well, support players, coaches, and teams in this pursuit of performance excellence. So for us, this really is that balance of performance and well-being. It's not either or, um, but you know, we, we've got to have both of those, those pieces there um, for this kind of a holistic approach that, that we take. So when we say step into um, into a team, we're really trying to um, support an, an environment that that can thrive. So where the people can thrive, um, you know, outside of that space, but also within it and professionally. Um, and this might be through things, I suppose, like looking at the culture, like looking at um, how, say, the staff all work together, looking at whether there is psychological safety within that space. And then we'll kind of be looking at implementing tools and methods um, kind of taken from research, from our professional training to try and support the needs. So again, this, this aspect of recognizing that each team is different, each team is unique um, and really taking in what the different contextual challenges and demands might be, but also what the strengths might be, what's really working well so recognizing what those needs are, what resources they have, whether resources is meaning their strengths, whether it's meaning their own MDT, do they have a wide range of different staff members or do they simply have a manager and a coach and a, an analyst, for example? And what might their values be and are these values being lived by or and congruent with, with how they're, they're, they're working as, as a team? So these things, of course, uh, uh, well, yeah, all, all um, going into our analysis or going into our intervention, but we go through this again, kind of cyclical sort of process where we are observing initially and yeah, really not doing much, trying to take a lot in, reflecting within our, um, the team, so within, with the four of us, but also with our extended team and making sure that we're checking with one another. So again, it's, it's pretty similar to what we were talking about before, but just kind of a, a slightly more simplified way of looking at it. Um, and yeah, how, how we approach and, and work with these very, I suppose, varying, varying contexts, varying teams and making sure that we aren't just copying and pasting something in, into each team, but we really are taking time to understand them, to listen, and to create something that's bespoke um, for the people we work with. Um, so I'll pass on to Matt and he'll just go through this in a bit more detail about what this might look like. Yeah, so on that, yeah, it's a good uh, transition there, the bespokeness. Um, I think when, when we um, enter a team, I think what I've learned from my experience is there isn't a really a one size fits all. And so what I have to really do is in the initial stages in the contracting or when you're talking with a team is you have to sort of, understand uh in what type of support you're going to provide them with so i think the default seems to be in sports psychology in general is this one-to-one -one work with players but you can work one-to-one -one with players for sure but then if they're walking back into a culture that um isn't always healthy then your work is incredibly limited and so this is sort of a, a bit of a model as to the different types of work we can do so you've certainly got that one-to-one -one stuff you can do profiling with them you can do all sorts You've got that more dynamic stuff. So that could be, you know, you and the coaching player that could be a tournament, but it's more of a flexible on the move approach, um, team level stuff. So um, that can be workshops, of course, but that, that can just be sitting in on performance reviews and facilitating that debrief, um, supporting the team. So supporting the team behind the team. So 
as being as part, I mean, this is an interesting area, but being a part of the MDT, then working on the MDT is, is equally important because we have knowledge in team dynamics and organizational functioning. Uh, and then finally, culture and organization. And I think the quote is sort of um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And um, I think anyone who's worked in an organization will respect that. And so um, I'll maybe often the hardest area to work with an org, the one that's probably the most difficult to access. A lot would want you to do that one to one because it's easier and people want to talk about personal control over environment. But if anything, the science is telling us now is that environment trumps personal traits. So uh, we're probably very keen in the future, I think, speak for IFEC here to have more influence at the organizational cultural level um, in the esports settings. Um, and obviously, sorry, just to make a point there is that on the side, you've got breadth to depth. So, yes, you get a lot more depth with one one to one, but you can impact a lot more people if you work at those higher levels with the staff and the organization. Um, and then um, this is actually quite um, relevant to coaches, actually learning opportunities. So, again, in the coach education literature, uh, different learning styles for coaches. You know, coaches talk about, well, it's not context specific, so I'm not going to even think about it. Um, they don't like formal, they tend to learn more through informal work. So uh, some are very independent thinkers. And if we think that esports players tend to learn independently a lot of the time, then perhaps stuff like self-help stuff is maybe might connect with them more. So I think it's just, again, that flexibility that when you go into an org, you're not to say, OK, we're going to sit down and have formal one to ones every week, because for some players that might not work. If we think about the stages of behavior change, some might not even be interested in that. So it might be giving them some neutral resources, some self-help stuff for them to consider first. And then you might pick up a conversation with them later. Um, and it may be more unique to the um, esports spaces. Informal stuff is a lot harder uh, because you're not just sat in a HQ together or walking around. You can have those corridor conversations, which we know in coaching or sports psychology is so important to our work. Um, so again, it's just a known that when we go into a team, we're looking at, well, what are the different learning opportunities these teams can get uh, outside of just the one to one, because that tends to be where they are. And also how context specific can we make it? Because the more contextual your uh, support will be, the more buy in and credibility you're going to get for it. So we are very keen, um, especially in the future, to look at that more live and training session support. So to really sit aside, uh, next to the coach in how they prepare for a training session. And to really help them just to think a bit more logically about well, how are you tapping into the psychological side of their training now and helping them, like uh, Matt alluded to earlier, those more intra and interpersonal skills as to, you know, how are you connecting with the players? How are you channeling their engagement? Um, and so I think that's somewhere we'll, I think, in the future, really start to head towards. Um, I don't know if Matt or Laura, if you had anything you wanted to say on that. Oh, I think you captured it nicely. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so just want to put this into a bit of an applied context, really. There's, or, yeah, slightly different different angle, um, so to speak. So if, if you think about the, the process of, of applied sports psychology over the course of a competitive season or a competitive split in, let's say, League of Legends, it's, it's, it's interesting to consider some of the challenges that I think practitioners face at present. So I just wanted to walk you through what in our case has been a fairly typical uh, experience of providing support and maybe it resonates with other practitioners on the call and maybe there's something that we can all do about it or, or share share knowledge to to uh, address or, or or cope with perhaps a bit better but let's say we've just been we're all a, a collective performance support team and we've just been tasked to to join uh, a, a established esports organization and provide support to their league of legends team the brief would be that the performance support includes all those levels that Matt's just discussed. So the org wants one-to-one -one sports psych support for players. The org wants to have these reflective conversations with the coaching staff. They want to have the support for the pedagogy, the interpersonal skills, interpersonal development. They want to have the observations in the team environment so that we can really triangulate and really get to the, the core of the key issues or key areas for performance support. And they'd like some group sessions, which involves the team and the players. And that can be, yeah, an hour or two every fortnight. And those topics would sort of reflect what we're seeing and what we think needs addressing or where people have expressed an interest in being educated, uh, so on and so forth. 
So all of that needs to fit into the timeline of the competitive splits. But at present, I think most practitioners, us included, are brought in, um, having signed an agreement, we're probably brought in fairly soon after that process. So we sign an agreement, sure, we'll come in, we'll provide support, we're really enthusiastic about this. When does it start? It starts next week. Okay, what access do we have to the team? Well, we're going to be around for two days. We've got a new roster of players, perhaps a new couple of new coaches on the team. We're going to boot camp for five days. So you've got uh, five days, but actually in that time, we're also going to need to do some admin. We're going to need to do some organizational stuff. So let's say let's have an intro session of an hour uh, and let's start maybe observations or intake sessions for those one-to-one -one sports psychology support sessions uh, in, in, in a couple of hours here and there. So in a very short space of time, we've got to be up and running and get going. There might then be, as in the spring split in League of Legends, there might then be a Christmas break. So uh, we've been on teams where coaches will have two or three weeks uh, apart from each other. And the off season has been so hectic that sometimes coaches need to completely step away. They're on the verge of burnout and there hasn't been a single competitive game played uh, with that roster or with that org. So it, it can be hard to track people down. It can be hard to continue support uh, in that time. And perhaps any of the good work that has been done, maybe there are questions over what's the carryover uh, following this break. Then we come back in, let's say January 2nd, uh, springs begin in full. So that means uh, an onslaught of full games. <laughs> We've got maybe four to five day games on a training day. We're training maybe four days a week, maybe six. And within that, we're gonna squeeze in some performance support sessions. Certainly, at least in this point, we can start in earnest with observations. So we can be around the team, we can observe them in scrims, we can be around their team meetings, we can start talking to the coaches a little bit about what they're seeing. But what are they seeing in that first week? Where, where are they at in terms of formulating their ideas about what makes this team tick and what their needs are? Bearing in mind that this has been uh, a team that hasn't been together for two or three weeks and before that was only uh, very briefly together. The following week after training really begins in earnest, games start, official games begin. So high pressure, very public, very widespread viewership of these games all begins. And every game matters because there aren't many games in a, in a, in a split compared to perhaps English Premier League in football, for example. And um, there's a lot riding on, on competitive performance. And from the studies that we've sort of mentioned in, in the presentation so far, a lot uh, a lot of sort of exposure, a lot of outcome um, evaluation rides on the results of these games. Player statistics are available online. They're widely uh, in depth. They receive in depth sort of uh, critique. Um, so these are sort of very stressful moments in the you know, potentially stressful moments in the in the experiences of a player, of a coach, um, an org owner, perhaps you know, one really invested uh, big time in a budget for a roster this time. So everything really matters when it comes down to that performance. Uh, outcome. So for the performance support, you can see that there are inherent challenges here. So how can you have a really thorough case formulation process, needs analysis process? How can you really thoroughly get to grips with what's going on in this team when the team is so fresh, when the relationships aren't, aren't, aren't formed? If, if you were to draw on research that, yeah, has received fair, fair criticism, but it's kind of interesting in this context, Tuckman, Tuckman's model of uh, Tuckman stages of group development, I mean, we'd be right back in that very first um, getting together phase, right? They're, we haven't even got to a storming, let alone a norming phase, arguably, right? Hypothetically in this situation. So this, these are, are real challenges for practitioners in esports. And especially if there's no guarantee that this is gonna be the first of many splits for you and your performance support team. So you have to maybe prove results or show results of your performance support in this narrow window of time. So. That's an interesting one, and um, it might sort of change your, the way you're practicing, but it's certainly something I think where we all have to work to show the long-term value of, of our support in terms of the well-being of players and personal and professional development of players. But also, certainly, over time, we would hope this, this support does equate to putting players and coaches and teams in a condition to achieve results and achieve those um, performances that everyone's after. So the takeaways here. Set expectations when you're entering into work with a team or with a, a new client. Set expectations as early as possible that there is no magic bullet here and certainly not one that can have an impact or the desired impact on performance within a matter of weeks. 
it, I mean, in sports psychology, you look at this process, it could take three months, six months, a year to be really embedded within a, within a team, understand the culture and, and develop a, a really sophisticated intervention. And developing rapport. So with, with IFEC, we, we have um, some fairly regular conversations with coaches who are after some support. And uh, often there's a rush to get to, well, what can I do? What practical tools can I uh, start to, to, to use right now to improve myself as a coach? But actually, it really, you really have to understand someone and really develop, develop a relationship with someone to be able to really offer benefit and offer value in terms of that, that practical change to their, their practice. And the same goes for working with a team. You really have to understand them. If you want to bring something in that might be beneficial, you really have to have a relationship of, of trust, of psychological safety to transmit those ideas and, and really see them used uh, in their entirety. So those are just some tips, I think, from us. And there's another conversation to be had about what does that actually really look like? And perhaps, you know, feel free to get in touch and we can have that conversation. Matt, could I make a comment now on that? Please do. Interrupt yeah, Please. from experience as well. So when... Yeah, that's a great timeline. And I think the issue that we find in this is the short termism. I mean, professional sport is very short term anyway, very outcome focused, which to some degree they have to be because their their um, financial stability is dependent on it, sadly. But um, when we start work with with teams, you know, I think we're very careful now to um, with those expectations about, well, how open and flexible are they to to being worked with? So if we're going to work with a coach, then we'll want to provide some suggestions, you know, nothing forcing them to do anything but some suggestions. But once you become under stress and pressure, um, you'll become less receptive. You'll just go back to habit. And I think our experience is, is that if that's not teed up in advance, um, once you're in the thick of the storm of the competition season, ideas just get thrown out the window. It doesn't matter how good people think they are that they just don't get taken on board so i think to anyone really is you've really got to tee this up in advance and always prepare prepare the coach for that you know that if this doesn't get discussed uh, in due course um if we're only discussing these things once the pressure hits the high likelihood is that there's not the work's going to be less effective than what it could be so i think that's an important point to make yeah fully agree so two, we're on one hour and two minutes of this presentation. So let's uh, wrap up with some takeaways. We're gonna try and thread the needle here and get IFEC, Applied Practice and Acolyte through these three takeaways. So uh, if I can remember the, the, how, we, how we did this, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be a miracle. So firstly, um, IFEC, what do we want? We want coaches to be able to work, uh, to be informed by evidence and be able to work from evidence to deliver a safe practice, to develop their own professional practice, and um, to feel supported, either by a community of peers, by IFEC, by the industry themselves, in recognizing the importance um, and the potential reach and impact of coaches. So that's uh, the takeaways for IFEC. In terms of applied practice, applied practice is, applied sports psychology practice is, is fundamentally about understanding the evidence and being able to deliver it and having an evidence base for your actions. This means that you are practicing effectively, you're practicing safely, you're practicing with competence, you're practicing, practicing ethically. And in doing so, you're likely to achieve a uh, effective support um, for your clients. Acolyte. So Acolyte is evidence-based practice um, in the wild, right? So we're actually out there doing it, we're working from an evidence base. We're really trying to um, work from this ethos of what does the research say? Um, how can we uh, take our observations, put it through the lens of, of, of scientific evidence and come up with um, an intervention that's really effective? Um, by doing this, by using uh, interventions that are backed by evidence, uh, th those interventions are likely to be as effective as they possibly could be. Um, and certainly they're, they're likely to um, be more aligned with what the actual uh, situation is. And if we're not working from evidence, it's not necessarily unsafe, but maybe it's unethical just to be throwing things at a situation without fully understanding it or without fully working from an evidence base. And Acolyte, I think in terms of support, yes, we're offering support, but also I think just by having this entity here that is, you know, has a nice logo and uh, brings together a team from far and wide, I think we're trying to raise the awareness of these issues in esports. So it's almost like support for the industry in, I think we would all agree that um, there are a lot of um, cases in esports that uh, having applied sports psychology practitioners in place 
uh, would have would have helped. And I think going forward, I, th I hope these are roles that we see more frequently uh, within esports. And I hope that everyone has yeah this minimum standard of practice accreditation uh, training that I, that I think is necessary. And we need to support the industry to understand the value of those roles and to give those roles the the support and to get them working in the conditions that allow them to do uh, good practice, safe practice, evidence based practice. I think that's the takeaways. Laura, Matt, did I wrap that up? All right. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. All right. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay, Ollie, how do we do? Wow, uh, thank you very much for for the whole presentation. I, I really enjoyed all of your parts. They are very valuable, and I liked how you um, build on the idea of um, the evidence base as a foundation, and also um, the idea of yeah benefiting from the collective experience of coaches and sport psychologists. And I know your hands are tight in terms of the time, but I would at least have 10 minutes for, for Q and a Q&A session. So I have two urgent questions um, that I would like to forward to you. But if the audience, if everyone that luckily joined today has questions, please raise your hands via the emoti emotion uh, function or put your question in the chat or send me a private message, then I will forward them to the speakers. So um, I'm egoistic, so I would start with my first question. And I think um, Matthew or Laura would be the best fit since they talked about safeguarding in esports. And you also addressed creating psychological safety. Um, can you provide a brief insight into how you achieve safeguarding in esports? from the perspective of coaches or sport psychologists? Yeah, well, it's certainly, there are a lot of resources out there about the expectations by country as to what, is, what are your ob obligations in regard to safeguarding. I think that some of this information is not always as, I think the word is practicable. It's not at, as easy to really grasp and put into practice as we would wish. But there are resources out there to explain how within your, in, your organization, there should be clear policy and procedures in place so that if someone has a concern or an issue, they know who to go to. So who is a designated safeguarding lead within your, within your organization, for example? And does that individual have the appropriate training to be able to take a matter forward? And to who should they go with those issues? So that's, you know, we're, we are a good point of contact for that within esports. So we know the, the terminology uh, within esports to maybe understand uh, someone's concern, not in terms of a safeguarding issue, but in terms of upskilling themselves in the area of safeguarding and getting that education. Um, but it's certainly there are, we're not professing to be uh, the safeguarding entity, right? There's a lot of work being done by a lot of very uh, prominent organizations. And you, I would, I would always invest effort in going out there and finding them and, and informing yourself if your organization doesn't have those policies in, in, in place. The other side of it is, some basic protections I think coaches should uh, ensure that they have in place to ensure they're, they're, they're sort of meeting these obligations. So one of them would be a basic criminal background check. So uh, if you can go to a potential employer and if, if they're not asking you for a background check, get one, show you have one, make that a common part of, of joining a new organization to try and get organizations used to uh, looking past your 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 public profile or social media uh, in terms of assessing your credibility for a role. I'd also say getting some letters of rec recommendation, like I, I, in coaching, maybe this is more common, right? But if you're applying for a role as a sports coach, it's, pro it's also, it's probably expected that you come with a criminal background check that's clear and that you have some letters of a recommendation if someone doesn't know you. It's just like applying for a job. It's like, have you got someone to vouch for you? Uh, and if we can start making that common practice, I think that the standards of, of protection to children, young people and vulnerable adults is significantly improved. And just to jump on the back of that, perhaps um, focusing a little bit more on the mental health side of things. Um, is that, well, it's something that actually um, Matt Ashford and Callum are doing a lot of really nice work on at the moment um, for us, but actually making sure that we can build in, say, referral routes, referral pathways into, say, clinical sites if we if we need to. This is something that I think we've all found quite challenging within esports, partially because of the 
um, sometimes players being in you know different countries, um, different mother tongues can make it difficult to make those referral links. But I think initially, if we can just be yeah upskinning ourselves on on mental health, what to look out for, um, whether that is say mental health first aid training. And we are at the moment trying to look at making some more esports specific training, whether that's for coaches or you know, people working within esports. Um, but yeah, I think it's certainly an important one to be considering. Thank you very much for the insight and the uh, great response. Um, for everyone that is interested in safeguarding in more detail, the International Federation of Esport Coaches website has the draft that was mentioned listed on its website under the header publications. So there you will find it right on the top. Um, before we move on to the two questions from the audience, um, I would forward my last question, um, which is something that or addresses something that Laura addressed in another session. And you said, who spends the most time with the players? It's going to be the coach, not the sport psychologist. So I wonder how can sport psychologists benefit or even performance coaches benefit from um, the statement and that the involvement of the coaches within the esport environment? Yeah, I think something that comes to mind for me, and this is probably one of my, I guess, beliefs is that, you know, psychology is for, for everyone. It isn't just for the, the psychologist. So that we can go out there and, and, you know, work with the coach and support them to support you know, interventions as well. Um, of course, we wouldn't just kind of set them off on their own without any kind of, kind of guidance, but say, for example, I suppose if we recognize that a player has, I suppose, low motivation, or let's say the basic psychological needs are being thwarted, actually us going in and, and you know, just doing one-to-ones with them might not make too much difference it might be more about how how is the environment being built or how is the coach communicating with the player so we then might be working with the coach and upskilling them on um say autonomy support of coaching or need support of communication and that's more of the intervention rather than us working directly with the player um so i think it's just really important that we are yeah, building up that rapport, building up that working relationship with, with the coaches. And the coaches are also a fantastic um, means for getting feedback and, and getting their observations. They are obviously with, with the players so much. They are seeing the, um, yeah, small changes, the, the, the challenges, the things that are going well when we might not always be there. And so it's really using that to our advantage and adding that, I guess, into like our data pool. Um, so that we can draw on their experiences and, and their knowledge. And, and often they know what the player will respond to and perhaps what's the best way to ask them something challenging or to get some information from them. So I think it is, yes, certainly using the staff and the environment around you to support the processes that we go through and, and not, yeah, just thinking that we're the only ones that can deliver psychology because um, it is certainly not always the most effective way to do it. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I know it's really covered it really, really well. I think um, I think kind of the mantra, isn't it, that it's about psychology, not the psychologist. And I think that um, we've, we, we've coaches, um, my experience has been that you can help them to support the players and, and, and obviously, you know, to introduce things, to get psychology into the environment. But if the coach isn't happy or the coach is struggling with themselves, then any psychology to support the players doesn't get through. So I think one of the roles also is just to help the coach deal with the challenges that they're facing personally. Um, and I guess it goes back to Madeleine's hierarchy needs a little bit. You know, if you've if you've satisfied those needs, you can then focus on other people. And I think, I, I honestly, I think, I'll be honest, I think 70% of the work is that sometimes, is that once the coach feels supported and they can manage it, then they're just going to go out and take risks and do things they maybe wouldn't do. And sometimes it's doing something a little bit different than you've done before. Uh, so I think, yeah, they're, and, and, and also sorry, in relation to their relationship with the players, their relationship is always going to be more significant than ours with the players. So impact in that is, is so crucial. Um, Thank you. Great points being addressed. Um, Laura, you, are you unmuted or do you want to add something? Oh, no, I'm, okay. I'm good. <laughs> okay. okay, then we finally move on to the question from Eric. 
Yo, hello guys. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting. My question would be regarding the trainer license because um, I'm very interested um, over the last years, more and more trainer licenses have, have been popping up, uh, especially in Germany. Um, the eSport Player Foundation is currently working on one with Fabian Broich as, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and um, also I'm part of the eSport um, the, um, the e Bund Deutschland, which is also um, working on, on, a, on a trainer license. We got around a few hundred people like on a um, weekend course, um, got th uh, through them and we got around 40 people through our C license, which is around 90 hours of um, co a coaching license. And we want to further this in, in the next year. So I'm I'm interested if if there's like um, an interest of like just discussing and just um, if if you're just interested in in the discourse of us about the C license and going further. I've unmuted. So okay. Um. <laughs> So, I mean, Eric, firstly, um, thanks for being here. And I feel like I every couple of months, I see a very positive comment from you about something that we might be doing. So really a, a, a heartfelt thanks for your interest in our work. Um, yeah, I, I guess, so I think maybe for the audience, I don't know, this may, maybe I'm overstepping, but I think that in Germany, so I have a German coaching license for basketball and uh, in other countries, especially in the UK, the, this concept of a license is a little bit off-putting, right? So a license would be, <laughs> uh, uh, James Bond came to mind, but that's wrong. So like a license to do something, right? You can't practice without this thing, right? It's like, uh, uh, you can't travel without a passport. You can't coach without this license, right? And I think that's not kind of, that's not what it means. It's, it's a qualification. It's a certification. It's evidence of training. So I think certainly we're, enthusiastic open to collaborating on all forms of coach education formal or informal the only uh, condition that is a, a very important to me and is very dear to my heart having pursued a lot of coach education in different sports basketball athletics even dodgeball i don't know why i did that um is that the the the, the qualifications the certification the training is evidence-based now two years ago IFEC thought about should we should we release some sort of qualification some sort of certification and at the time there was very little evidence that's context specific to say what it means to be an esports coach so how could we therefore build training that is evidence-based because we'd have to go so far down that level those levels of evidence to find something that's relevant that it doesn't fit with the the context or the needs or the the everyday experiences of those coaches working in esports so now I think and Okay, so now I think we have some evidence about what it means to be an esports coaches, esports coach, and their needs. And when I say some, I mean there are two papers that have been published. There's mine, and there's another paper uh, that looked at team managers, a few coaches, and things like that. But these are still very exploratory papers. It's still very uh, general ideas about what it means to be a coach in esports. We don't have any game specific. Well, our, our paper was game specific in the sense the sample was only League of Legends but it was making generalizations about what it means to pursue a career in esports coaching. So the only concern I have about, about offering training at the moment is, um, is there a sufficient evidence base to make sure this training is effective? And then you're gonna say, well, you're doing, you're working on some levels, so what are you talking about? And I'd be the first person to admit that our, our courses are really focused on the process of coaching. And I think there is some strong evidence to say that, uh, the interpersonal skills as for working as a coach in esports are somewhat similar to the process of um of coaching in, in sport but the context needs to be understood and i think certainly in our team i think we have the expertise to understand the context we've really spent a, a significant amount of time trying to make sense of it and the demands as i said with the timeline for example so how does that affect what can be practically delivered uh, in terms of training to a coach so long-winded answer there i'm all for it happy to collaborate i think you know we're not the gatekeepers here ifec is not going to be the only coaching entity in esports nor should it be i think some diversity and varieties is certainly healthy 
Um, maybe in the future we see uh, region-specific coaching organizations set up. And uh, in the spirit of esports, I think it's really important to collaborate as much as possible because we're a small pool of esports researchers. We're a small pool of esports coach developers and, and applied practitioners. So working together at this stage seems to be in everyone's interest. Is that too political? I don't know. <laughs> Is that a good answer? I think that was a good answer. And Eric also looks satisfied. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks um, and then we will move on to Isma, who has a question for you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. Thank you so much for the nice presentation, all of you. It was uh, very informative and, and great put. Um, so I have a question. Um, so coming from a perspective of elite performance or elite esports, let's say, uh, and as well in professional sports, traditional sports. So some of you mentioned about the, the issue of outcome driven or result uh, sort of driven approach that we have in, in, in the elite in any, in any domain. Um, but something that that could be a problem, but like, I think like uh, Matthew Ashford mentioned, mentioned, yeah, this needs to happen, right? Because then we need funding, they need money. So you need to perform in order to, to maintain the sustainability of, of your organization. Something that you guys do uh, and, and mentioned very nicely is about the safeguarding, right? Um, sort of this sort of approach. And I think that's very important. But how do you see this duality of safeguarding approaches in these elite environments where you mentioned again, there is burnout or on the verge of burnout, there are mental health issues because the practice is shaped according to, uh, to uh, depending on the pressure to win, right? So how do you see this duality? Because definitely it's an issue that we have in traditional sports at the elite level. Um, and in esports, it feels like the high performance uh, domains are more relevant than the talent development domains. So how do you see this? And I don't know, any thoughts on, on, on this? I can, I can chime in, yeah. I think, yeah, it's an unfortunate reality, isn't it? I think we have to accept that it's the reality first and foremost, and we are not going to be able to change that too much. But I think there's things we can do that can level the playing field. I think, it, it, like I say, it has to be outcome and something else. So, um, yes, we recognise players, the high turnover, um, they've got to perform to win and make prizes, but that doesn't mean that can neglect everything else we know that can enhance their well-being. So, okay, we know that's not going to contribute much to well-being. Actually, it might diminish it. But these are other things we can do. So we can still focus on development, skill development. Maybe that's, um, you know, sitting down with the coach and they've got a development plan to work towards. So they are being able to focus on that process and that mastery or experience a sense of growth outside of it. Um, yeah, and there could be even sort of education around the negative effects. I think my experience is a lot of these players are very young and they don't actually even recognise the harmful impacts of that a, a lot. And maybe some do when they get older, but I think, you know, when they're getting the money and when they're young, maybe not so. So um, I think it's just appreciating that reality, maybe educating on its negative effects and then trying to put more protective things in place. Um, but I'll be honest and say I can't see it. I've got a perfect answer to it because... It's, you know, working with the psychologists in professional, traditional sport, a lot of them don't go near that stuff. You know, they they say, right, my corner is well-being, counselling sort of stuff. That's just sport culture and I can't change that. So it will be a challenge for any psychologist to want to go in and to really tackle that head on if they were going to do that. Yeah, and I was kind of thinking about, as, as Matt was speaking a little bit about, you know, it's got to be the integration of it uh, and uh, and I know like you say Matt some sites well some sites either won't touch the performance side or some sites won't touch the the well, well-being side in in sport um but I I think from my perspective and again this is probably just my kind of personal beliefs and kind of philosophy is that it's got to be integrating the, the two of them I think if we go and you know kind of bash down the door and we're just talking about well-being 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 then people are going to turn off, people are going to switch off to it. So I think it is how can we kind of carefully integrate the two, like Matt said, kind of into, I suppose, the, the processes into the culture. So it doesn't seem, 
almost so separate like we always kind of say performance and well-being but it's sometimes they can seem like very separate entities but I think it is yeah educating upskilling that actually well if we get the well-being part right then the performance is, is gonna you know potentially look a lot better it's potentially gonna be more long term or more consistent so I think it's almost trying to bring that to the fore trying to reflect on that with people and make sure they're picking up on the signs where we do see that the well-being part is supporting the performance because I think it's easy to miss that sometimes um and I as well like M Matt mentioned earlier when you get into that kind of high stress part of the of the split or whatever it is then a lot of those plans potentially a lot of the well-being stuff might go out the window because it's like well we just need to focus on the performance now so I think it's about yeah trying to integrate them trying to make it consistent within the environment but yeah man it's it's not an easy thing it certainly isn't an easy thing no I, I just I just add to that point as well that um it could then be about if we know this is a common demand that we can't necessarily influence then maybe we look at the identity of the player and you know there's work in the background to help them to be able to invest in areas outside of the sport so there's a, there's a so with one of the players at the pro teams now but a really difficult and it's a real good learning curve for me but um pro player you know you know he was top top five top ten he's now had to get an ordinary job because he's been dropped from the team and has no income and that's a massive fall from a position where you're a top 10. And so helping players with that personal identity um, and working on that in the background might be the next best thing if we can't influence the culture enough. Mm. I would also like to comment on this in like a million dollar question in a sense. Uh, so like building on what the others have said, I think part of this is a question of value. So we know that Orgs in esports, the budgets don't extend for two to three years, in most cases, for for ongoing performance support. Uh, but if we think about value, let's think about my PC for a second. So I bought uh, my first ever gaming PC not so long ago, and uh, about a month ago, it started making a really noisy sound, and. Um, I lack the skills to open it up and see what's going on. So a couple of times I've given it a bump and hasn't really changed things, but maybe it's dulled the sound a little bit. Now, is that, is that in my interest in terms of value, right? If I carry on hitting my PC, sure, the sound could go away and it could be miraculously fixed or the PC will break and I'll have to buy a new one. So the value for me would be, okay, I need to spend some time, maybe some money getting it looked at or look at it myself, rather than having to fork out for a new PC every six months because I, I, I hit it too hard and I break it. So the mess for I'm trying to get across is how can we, how can we convince organizations that it's in their interest in terms of value to invest in the support for their players? So their, if their players are, are not protected and they're burnt out and they break, it's not going to bring the reward to value for that organization. And it's the same with, and part of those protecting them and, and, and supporting the players and putting them in the conditions where they can thrive is having the right staff around them. And then the onus is on those practitioners to demonstrate their, their, their ability to, to, to support players in that, in that respect. And then it's up to research to prove or show or indicate, never prove, right? But indicate that there are some performance related meaningful performance related outcomes as a result of looking after your product your players in that respect wishful thinking right because it's my i mean you've developed high performance systems at the very top of esports for many years now um and you've done a fantastic job but it's 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 not without its challenges and i think budgets and winning will influence a lot of the key decisions and at a time now where your money isn't guaranteed for such a long time it's hard to take the gamble uh, and really sign up this support for, for so long but i i think in terms of value looking at sustainability it's it's in everyone's interest to pursue the support for players who are at the core of this industry for much longer than we're currently doing and then within that there are minimum standards of safeguarding i would say so there are there are things that organizations must be doing to ensure that people are protected 
then there are practices that I think fall into what Colin Cronin would, would call a, a duty of care. So you can push a player, you can be hard with a player, but from a position of care, which means you really, you know that person, you've, you've got a good relationship with that person, you know that this is um, coming from uh, a, a place of, of good intention and it's planned, but it, it comes from a place of you're, you're invested in that player, right? It's, it's a position of care and you care about them, you care for them, you also care about your job, your professionalism, and it's not just unplanned, uh, uncoordinated, yeah, bumping the PC every now and then. So, bit of a ramble there, but I, yeah, I mean, Ismail, that's like the question, isn't it? Um, I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think like you guys mentioned, like that's the reality. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to actually make an impact from the talent development perspective rather than changing or fixing the pieces, the pieces of that PC, right? Because this is basically what we're doing at the elite level. We are just trying to change or trying to fix some of those pieces. Just the bump on the PC is basically what we're doing. But we know that that's not necessarily changing the, the culture of the industry where we are. Um, and, and definitely, I guess like the, 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 work, the work that you are doing with coaches is very important because in the end, they are the ones who are sharing the message to the players to actually make a change on identity or on how we are creating culture in esports. But definitely, we would like to, to work hand-to-hand uh, -hand with those who are making the decisions. But if they don't, they are not on the same board and they, they, they want these uh, short-term outcomes. Um, so definitely, we're struggling. So when, let's say, we work with these organizations, I think uh, someone mentioned, some of you mentioned like, yes, you need to have a clear or address clear expectations on what you can deliver, how you could deliver and what do they want, right? But then sometimes you don't get to say what expectations uh, you you have for, for this team or for this roster or for this year. So it's them the ones who tell you, these are the expectations. So it's a little bit of, okay, there is a, uh, I guess, I guess like a philosophical uh, issue here of, okay, do I say yes to, to these expectations that have been set by those members, those decision maker, or do I actually go my way and say, okay, no, this is not gonna work because we're losing the value of what we're trying to bring, uh, especially with this uh, coaching uh, aspect. So, so yeah, that's a reality, but uh, I mean, it's, those are the challenges for sure. And, and that was something that as well, maybe is good for you to, to share at some points is the challenges that you go through on this path, because I think we learn from that. And I think that's very, very valuable. But yeah, thanks for the answers. Yeah, just because then I think the challenges will be quite common amongst us, um, I'm sure. And I think the great point you make there is how flexible do you get in these environments? How much you, because <clears throat> at the core of it is your own values. And what you think is important so how willing are we to sacrifice some of those um and i i, I yeah i again i don't have an answer but it's so hard you know what i mean because on the one hand you want to keep that rapport and keep that relationship because you think maybe later down the line you might get an opportunity versus what you're seeing in the meantime so yeah definitely one on challenges would be really cool i'd look forward to that and and, and i say that as well hearing your own and everyone else's because I'm sure there'll be a lot of similarity between people. Yeah, I think you just draw a pretty lovely picture there, Matthew, um, with with you hitting the PC, because we we need to understand the PC, the player itself, but also the environment, the Matthew hitting uh, the PC, um, and therefore we need a holistic base of knowledge from the applied side, but also from the research side, and a lot of um, work has to be put into the eSport environment in the future. And I think we provide a starting point, um, providing, or you provide a starting point, I did nothing. You provide a starting point um, on the insides of applied practice and highlighting the current work that you are doing. So I would recommend everybody that hasn't read the papers that are listed on their publication heading on the website of the IFOC, um, for example, the one by um, Lois Wettenham and Amy Whitehead on developing group cohesion, I think, no, developing team cohesion. So working in esports and also the paper by Matthew Watson and colleagues on the parallel approach of sport psychologists and um, 
performance coaches see are essential papers that help us going this way, going the right direction of um, knowledge, evidence-based knowledge, and um, benefiting from applied practice and experiences. So, um, Matthew, once again, congratulations on the paper that is accepted. This is also the right step to, to take for the sport and coaching review. It's a huge achievement. Thank you, everyone, for the... With Isma, by the way. Isma. And Isma, yeah. yeah Thank you for the lovely insights. I, I really enjoyed it, and I think everyone else did too. Thanks for watching. And everyone that's in the audience right now, please stay in the chat after I end the recording because I have an important question that only addresses the audience. And that's it. Thanks for joining. Thanks for watching, Matthew, Matthew, and Laura. Do you have any last words? Thanks, Ollie. Thanks for inviting us and for, for yeah. Thanks, Ollie. Yeah, appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks, Ollie. And thanks, everyone, for, for listening. Everyone for listening as well, yeah. You're welcome.